Here's your host, Alex Garrett. Well, here on the Alex Garrett Podcast, uh, I just want to say thank you for sharing your condolences and well wishes and prayers for our family at this time. Yeah, I haven't podcasted in a little bit because over the weekend, we lost my dad, John Garrett, Johnny Lee Garrett, at the age of 85. Um, I will not do a whole blowout memorial on this podcast. Instead, I'm going to do it as thoughts come up, as times come up, as I feel a call to play the audio I got of him over the last few months and even to last year. But that will come in due time. I just want to take this moment to say thank you for all the wishes, the messages, the love. Um, My family and I are certainly feeling it. And I tell you, there is tough times visualizing his end of life and his his with us life. Because it's just incredible how fast things went from him just going to MetLife Stadium even two months ago to now this. And... You know, he told me this wasn't the plan for this year, and I believe God had it planned for for all of this, and he's in God's hands now. And as far as the podcasting goes, I will say this. You know, my dad always listened at certain points to hear what I had to say, mainly on radio, but sometimes I'd throw in the podcast. And he'd, he'd always like to say... um, that I gave, quote-unquote, half the story. And to me, I will measure my words on this podcast knowing that he's going to be in my ear, like a producer in your ear. Uh, Every time I want to say something, is this right? What would my dad say? That's going to happen. So if there are distinct pauses and there are distinct, like, uh, switch over, switch arounds or something like that, it's probably because my dad was talking to me uh, as I'm doing the podcast. And I don't know about you, but I can hear all his different catchphrases he would say over the years. And I miss his voice already. I also miss not hearing from him after every playoff game. You know, the Kings are up 2-0, and I, uh, the Sacramento. And I'd love to talk to him because he was very intrigued about the Warriors over the years and how they had their rise and now fall, it looks like. Uh, and, of course, in hockey, we have all three teams making it. Rangers, Devils tonight. So, yeah, there's a lot of sports that he will miss out on. And, you know, some people say it's the first Christmas. It's the first birthday. without. It's the first this. I'm feeling it right away because my dad was so involved. He would talk to me after every game possible. And that's that's what I'm going to miss right out the gate. Right out the gate. So as details come more available, we are going to the crematory today. And I'm a little nervous about that because now you've got to carry on his legacy and 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 make sure that his he stays alive. But what I want him to know, and I know you're listening up there, Pop. What I want him to know is that he was loved and cared for, and and really just included, even if he didn't feel it at times. He always was, and I think that's the message I want to carry with me the next few weeks here as and 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 years and forever so that's where we're at but this podcast cannot stop it can't come to a grinding halt completely that's why i have rebooted it as we get through this grieving process here and i wanted to throw it to an interview i did this past wednesday i got his book got an interview with jim stemple he's a historian new jersey native and he talks about the American Revolution and New Jersey's impact on the revolution, on winning independence, on keeping independence after the war and after the declaration. And his book is called Harassing an Enemy. Without further ado, my conversation with Jim Stemple. Well, I'm Alex Garrett, and uh, today on the One Leg Up podcast, I've got author Jim Stempel, Mr. S-T-E-M-P-E-L, on my podcast today to talk about something you've never heard about, 
of regarding the American Revolutionary War. Now, Jim, thanks for joining me on the podcast, firstly. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Alex. I, you know, I'm always fascinated by history, and this book really caught my eye because we all know about when Washington mm-hmm. crossed the Delaware, but your, our tri-state area, the Garden State, had some victories as well, and that's where you kind of start off the book, isn't it? Yes, for sure. Uh, it starts off with Trenton and Princeton. I mean, the conception, the general conception of the Revolutionary War during this period now is everybody kind of remembers Trenton and some remember Princeton. And then it seems to fall off of a cliff and disappear uh, during the winter months. And then it seems to reappear in the early months of 1777, or I should say summer and fall of 1777, as Washington moves to de- defend Philadelphia from the British at that time. Philadelphia is the capital of the United States, and that's where it seems to pick up again. But what I discovered is that there was actually an enormous amount of fighting that went on in New Jersey during that period of time that really hasn't been written about. Well, I know you're a New Jersey native, so is that a part of why you were fascinated with the New Jersey side of this war? Well, well, it is. Actually, what happened was, uh, this is this is my 10th book, and I was contacted by Roger Williams, who is the editor at um, um, Knox Press, and we had a long conversation one time. He was interested to know if I would uh, consider writing for Knox Press, and we talked about the goings on in New Jersey, and he told me a little bit about this period, which really did catch my interest, because like you said, I grew up in New Jersey, in central New Jersey, in fact, and I didn't know that much about what he was talking about, so that did pique my interest, and I started looking into it deeper and deeper and deeper, and what I found was there was an enormous amount of, of battle and action and fighting and casualties going on in central New Jersey that no one had ever really heard about before. For for instance, I mean, I grew up in Westfield, New Jersey, which is not terribly far from New York. And when I was a kid, there was a lot of lore in town about the the Revolutionary War. And one of those things was that they had caught a British spy and they had hung him uh, there on the gallows in Westfield. When I was a kid, I used to ride my bike down Gallows Hill Road. And the lore was there was a ghost there and all this stuff. And it made me a little bit nervous. But as I got into this period, I found out that all that was lore, but what actually did happen was fantastically more important than what all the lore was. In fact, the entire British Army, 16,000 strong in two divisions, marched into Westfield, bivouacked overnight, tore the town to shreds, marched off with all the money and all the livestock from the place, and I had never been taught any of that, any of it. Nobody knew about that. So that's when I really started to realize that, gosh, there's a lot of information here that I need to know and I think that it really would help our understanding of the revolution and certainly the people in the the tri-state area understanding something important was going on in New Jersey that's never really been written about before. This this knowledge, by the way, i got to ask you about the colony after colony that sort of stood up against the British, right? It seemed like it came colony after colony. Was Jersey one of the first to stand up to them? before even, you know, the independence? Were they one of the first colonies to really say, we're we're done with this? Or where does Jersey fall in line with the whole rebellion in the first place? Well, there wasn't a lot of action in New Jersey at the time, but the the sympathies were about a third of the people in Jersey, from what I've been able to tell, were for the rebellion, a third uh, were against the rebellion, and a third were indifferent. That changed a lot during 1776 and 1777. And the, the loyalty switched over hard towards the, um, towards the rebellion, towards Washington's army and for uh, independence because of the, the actions of the British throughout New Jersey that were pretty brutal. Um, they, had, they had, in their march from New York City down to the Delaware River, they had created large swaths of just wasteland in New Jersey where the, the people fled their farms and homes, the British uh, burned a lot of them, uh, beat a lot of men, raped a lot of women, and it was uh, it was an ugly time in New Jersey, and it continued on into 1777. So I would say that early on, New Jersey probably was like the rest of the colonies. They were lagging behind a little bit. It was Massachusetts that really started the rebellion. But once it got rolling and it moved down to New York City, the actions of the British caused a lot of the people to turn their loyalties. 
got to ask you this because, you know, it, it's interesting what you're telling us because I feel like Jersey is not really a reenactment state, meaning we know in Williamsburg, we know in, you know, different parts of Virginia, we definitely know with the crossing of Delaware, I mean, and up in Massachusetts. But Jersey's not known for being a reenactment state, so are there reenactments going on of these very battles you talk about in the book? Well, the first thing you need to understand is that, um, let, me, let me explain, that there were a couple dynamics going on in New Jersey. There were not a lot of big battles going on, and that's one of the reasons we don't know it that well. And, and the reason for that is that George Washington at the time, uh, it, it, Congress had established the Continental Army in a number of establishments, and they were one-year enlistments. And as Washington moved into New Jersey in 1777, he made his headquarters at Morristown. The second establishment, which was they had uh, enlistments from January 1st, 1776 to December 31st, 1776, they were marching off. And Congress had made a third establishment, but they weren't marching in. So Washington was at a decided manpower disadvantage during this entire period of time. He could not possibly afford to get drawn into a major engagement. All he could do was really harass the enemy, hence the title of the book. So um, he, we, saw, I, I, we found a return from early March 1777. At that time, Washington had about 2,200 Continentals, and they were spread all across New Jersey. At the same time, Cornwallis, who was the operational, uh, in operational command of the British Field Army at New Brunswick, had about 18,000 troops. So Washington couldn't possibly get drawn into an engagement, a major engagement at that time It would have been suicidal. The British, on the other hand, they had all, everything they, need, ex they needed except for one thing, and that was forage for their animals. 18th century um, armies moved with wagons and caissons and limbers for their artillery. They were all drawn by animals. They needed food to keep those animals alive. And so they had to get out into New Jersey to try to get that, that forage for their animals. New Jersey at the time was a very agrarian place. It was, every, it was very, very prosperous. They had great farms. So the British were trying to get a lot of that, the timothy and alfalfa hay and the straw. And the militias in New Jersey initially violently opposed that. And so then did the Continentals. And that's where a lot of this um, came about. So you have a lot of small actions going on constantly, daily, not just big battles, but daily actions as the British were trying to get forage for their animals and the Americans were fighting them. And that's why it didn't make a lot of news anywhere. You know, if you have a couple hundred British marching out and they take, you know, five dead and 13 wounded, that's not making news anywhere. But this was going on constantly over, eight, over an eight-month period. And that's why the uh, casualty totals went up radically. For instance, the um, casualty rate for the British in New Jersey, they suffered about 3,300 casualties during this entire period. Now, that means nothing to you until you compare it to what they suffered during their entire New York campaign. That's what I'm talking about, the Battle of Long Island and um, Washington, uh, Fort Washington, Fort Lee, White Plains, that period of time. They only suffered 1,500 casualties. So it was well over twice the number of casualties, and yet nobody's really heard of the New Jersey campaign of 1777, and yet most people know about the uh, New York campaign, at least those who are interested in American history. So that's the type of dynamic that was going on. There were a lot of small engagements, militia attacks, a lot of bushwhacking, ambushes, and things like that that were taking a brutal toll on the British Army over a period of time. Uh, during COVID, we talk about rebellion. Were you worried that there was going to be some sort of rebellion event against this government? I mean, I always thought our own government was created to protect its own citizens, not force them to go against its own government. Yet we, we saw a lot of lawsuits, we saw a lot. But, you know, when talking about rebellion, do you find any parallels to the way people were fighting the COVID mandates and whatnot? Not the violent part, but just the standing up and resistance, if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the British uh, in 1777, they uh, issued a proclamation to the people of New Jersey saying basically that anyone who came forward and signed the proclamation would be treated fair and they would forgive them if they had been on the rebel side. So a lot of people did come forward, but guess what? The British didn't treat them any better at all. Their homes were still being ransacked. Their brothers were still being beaten. 
And this really turned the people of New Jersey violently against the British. They saw a really oppressive um, occupation of New Jersey in those, peri- in those areas where the British were. And every time they mar- the British marched out, they caused havoc in, in the general population. So, yeah, I mean, a government, that's one of the first rules of government, right? Um, that goes back to Rousseau and, and the, the contract with the people is that people are willing to give up some of their rights so long as the government protects them. Once the government starts uh, oppressing people and not protecting them but injuring them, then you, you get, you'll get problems in any free population. And, yes, do I see things that are uh, similar? Similar for sure. There's a lot of unrest right now with the government, uh, certainly in Washington and several state governments. It's, it doesn't seem to be that um, – public officials really care about the people anymore. i got to ask you this question because obviously um, people like myself and you want to preserve American history, so how big is telling the story of preserving the history? You know, we're only 3 eight years out from 250 years, so there's some correlation to that kind of preser- preservation of the history and what you're saying here, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I'm... My wife and I, we've lived the American dream. I'm not writing these books for myself. I'm writing these for my children and their grandchildren and their grandchildren because I would like everyone to be able to live in a free country, a country governed by law, and have the ability to grow and prosper and do as best as they can do. That's, that is the American dream, and that has caused the United States to become an enormously popular and um, successful country, the, the most successful in the history of mankind. To, to understand that even, you have to have some perspective. You have to have some understanding of history and understand that every, every one of us living today is living in the greatest time on the history, in the history of, of humankind. I mean, we have virtually all the food we want, any kind of food we want. Um, we can move at will. We can drive where we want. We have in the history the entire knowledge of mankind virtually at our fingertips nowadays. And yet, how many people have any appreciation of that? I, I think very few. As, at times that I'm, I'm the same way, I think, oh, my gosh, what's going on? You have to ha- have a serious understanding of history to understand how fortunate you really are. I'm going to ask you a bit later if we make it to 2026 and make it to 250 as a country, but before we get there, the research, I mean, come on, did you, did you, the research you had to do to get this book published and written and all that, very extensive, right? Because this is dealing with artifacts, documents, and even journals from eons ago. Expensive? No, I did buy some books, but a lot of things nowadays are online, and I wrote most of this during the COVID um, lockdowns and all that. Fortunately, I wasn't locked down here. I live in Maryland. And I could go around anywhere I wanted, but that didn't mean I could get into various buildings, government buildings. Fortunately, a lot of things are online, and I could find them there. And the ones that I couldn't, um, that I wanted to, I could buy quickly and have it shipped here. It didn't cost me a fortune. It cost I, I probably bought 10, 11 books. But most of the stuff I found online, and, and fortunately, all of the um, founders' uh, letters and things like that, all their correspondence is online now. So. That's a fabulous thing that, you know, again, you can go back and get all of Washington's documentation. If you don't like George Washington, if you don't think he was the kind of man that he should have been, go back and read what he had to deal with. It's right there. You can find it. It's um, on Founders Online. Anybody can go read them all. And you'll find out that he was, he was quite a leader. He really was. And he was a man of great character, in my opinion. Well, that, that's, that's good to know. I mean, obviously, they're all online, but... But did you have um, – when people want, let's read Enemy Harassed, what can they look forward to? Not only stories, but as I mentioned, any quotations, any kind of like perspective from the actual fighters on the battlefield, or how did you go about writing it? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I tried to have um, a whole range of perspectives from the top leaders on both sides giving their opinions. And so you can follow their thinking and their strategy down to the um, his, his lieutenant – um, commanders like uh, William Maxwell and Nathaniel Green, we have some of that, right down to the people who are actually fighting it. Uh, I have uh, things from American uh, soldiers in the field, their diaries and journals, and I have things from 
British and Hessian soldiers in the field. There's one man in particular, uh, Captain Johann Ewald, who wrote a long journal, and his uh, he was a Hessian captain, but he was he was a very fi- fair-minded man, and his his view of the events then are, are really worth reading because he 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 was working for the British, but he in a way admired the Americans when they did well, and he was he was a very fair-minded man. So you could you could see a neutral. Um, approach to things, and get, you get some really good ideas on what was going on from him. But there are a lot of, I have a lot of people in there, a lot of quotes from a lot of different people as to what was going on. And th- so, so you, get a, you get a feel for not only what Washington was thinking and what Howe and Cornwallis were thinking, but men in the, in the, in the trenches, so to speak, who are out there fighting every day. All right, I'm going to ask you this real fast. Uh, you know, Hamilton was put putting American history on the map, so I kind of deal with pop culture. And I don't know if you you, you watched it, you listened to the soundtrack, but do you think that when the woman Miranda did a good job documenting it? Also, I don't know. It just it it brought people's mindset to that era through that musical, did it not? Uh, yeah, apparently I haven't seen it. Um, I don't know how closely it tracks to history. Um, uh, yeah, but it, it, I've had a number of people talk to me and say, you know, that uh, sort of inspired them to start looking into the revolutionary period. I mean, Alexander Hamilton in 1777 was brought on to George Washington's staff at Morristown. That's the first time we really see him appear in any significant position, but he was just a junior officer at the time. So, But Washington saw in him a, a fine mind, and that's what he was always seeking to have around him, people who could think well, could write well, were well-educated, and were smart. Uh, Washington was good in that regard. He wasn't scared of people who were intelligent, and he always sought their views. But, yeah, from what I understand, I I haven't seen Hamilton, um, but uh, I I don't think it tracks too closely with history, but it's something that that, uh, inspired people to look into it. Got to ask you this, because I see you graduated from Citadel, and I was actually on their campus for a minute when I was in South Carolina, a beautiful place. But the academic institutions are not teaching this history, right? So how are you looking to work with the academia, even your alumna, you know, your alma mater, on, on getting this history recorded and, and taught to the students of today? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? I mean, my wife uh, was a um, professor at a local college here. She, she taught um, physics and astronomy, and she saw – exactly what you're talking about going on, that the kids knew nothing of their own history. And, and actually, it really hasn't been taught in, other than in certain areas of the country. Now, if you go into Tennessee or Texas and some different places, American history is still being taught. But here in Maryland, it's not really. It's civics isn't being taught. Kids have no idea how their government works. So when things aren't working, they think, well, this stinks. We just need to do something different. They don't understand their government. They certainly don't understand their history. And it's a huge problem. That's one of the reasons I started writing books, just with the idea that I didn't think I was going to solve this problem myself, but I thought I could at least help with it and write some things um, that were interesting that might inspire people to investigate their own history. But it's a huge problem. And the only way we're going to turn that around is um, to go back and start teaching civics and start teaching honest American history. I don't care what we, – we can bring in all perspectives into that history. That's fine. But we're forgetting about the founders. And, you know, I guess at, cert, at a certain level, people have forgotten we fought a civil war, right, that 500,000 men died to help free slaves. And that seems to have just been lost to history. Amazing. Sad, actually. How would Jim Stemple, he's the author of The Enemy Harass, Washington's New Jersey Campaign of 1777. Obviously, what caught my eye was when you were saying, oh, yeah, I talk about the 1776 Washington crossing the Delaware, so let's go there for a minute. Um, is there anything untold about that that we don't know that you might give us some insight to? Because it clearly was a, there was a lead-up to what happened you know, before and after New Jersey um, to Delaware, right? To, to Delaware. Yeah, I'm not sure. Sorry. Oh, the Delaware River. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, the um, the revolution 
the Revolutionary War at that point was really on its last gasps, and Washington knew it. Like I said, the uh, second establishment was about to march off, and he was going to have nothing to fight with. At that point in time, he knew he had to do something to <clears throat> excite the war effort, to um, gain the confidence of the people again. And, and his, his crossing of the, the Delaware River on Christmas night, 1776, was as much a, an aspect of desperation as it was anything else. He had to do something before those, all those enlistments ran out. And it was, you know, one of the more miraculous victories, certainly in American military history. He was able to turn everything around almost overnight. Uh, you know, he attacked a brigade of Hessians, caught them by complete surprise. In about an hour, the, the victory was entirely over. He captured about 800 Hessians, killed quite a few, and a number ran off. It um, electrified the country, at least those people who were, uh, confident in terms of the, the, or wanted the rebel cause to survive and move on. It was an enormous victory. What people don't understand is that Washington then went back over the Delaware and recrossed it. Um, then about three or four days later, he believed he had the British on the run and he ordered his troops to concentrate on Trenton again, but the British weren't on the run. Um, General Howe in New York had gotten wind of Washington's victory at Trenton and had ordered Cornwallis to return and march with all the troops he could and destroy Washington, which Cornwallis was on in, uh, doing. He was marching. He came to Princeton, gathered up about five or 6,000 troops and marched on Trenton again. But the weather had turned um, warm suddenly. What had The weather in New Jersey was in the, in the entire area had gone up and down all winter, what had been frozen roads turn, finally turned to mud for the British march. And they came in, they slogged into Trenton late in the day, and Cornwallis deployed his troops, and there was a little bit of fighting, but they lost daylight. Cornwallis decided that he could, he had uh, Washington pinned against the, the Delaware River, he could destroy him in the morning. But Washington wasn't about to stick around, and he had held a conference of his, of his officers, and they knew of some back roads, and they had local uh, people that could lead them out. So overnight, the roads, the roads froze again, almost amazingly, with a, a north wind blew in, froze the roads, allowed the Americans to slip away. They marched overnight to Princeton, attacked the British at Princeton, won another victory there. Now, what people don't know a lot is that at that time, um, Cornwallis had his major depot at Brunswick, which was New Brunswick today, and it contained an enormous uh, stash of supplies and things, but it also contained a treasury of uh, 70,000 pounds sterling, an enormous amount of money that was supposed to finance the British uh, war effort in, in the con in the, on the continent. And um, Washington knew it was there, and now Cornwallis realized when he was at Trenton, because he heard the gunfire behind him, that Washington was closer to all that money and all those supplies than he was. And it turned, it turned him in, into a total panic. He forced his army back up the road at the double quick, desperate to get to that, those supplies before Washington could get there. And Washington had an, an idea of going there, and he got to a crossroads just north of Princeton called Kingston, where the road forked. And one fork went north, uh, east towards Brunswick, the other one straight north into the New Jersey mountains. And Washington really wanted to go get that because he knew what it could mean. But he was looking at his troops. Now, these were men, you have to understand, they had been marching and fighting at night in the cold, in the bitter cold. A lot of them had no shoes, no coats, no hats. They had been sleeping on the frozen ground for days, marching and fighting two battles. And he took a look at these men, and he realized they'd had it. You know, they'd had it. You can only push men so far. And had he... Um, made a move towards Brunswick, there's a good chance he would have been run down by the British, and the American Revolution m might have run on the flat road there between Kingston and Brunswick. But he made a very wise decision, and not an aggressive one, but a very wise one. He decided not to make that move and to go north into the mountains. But all that money was there for the taking. Had, had he gotten it, uh, uh, the, the American war effort would have taken a huge leap forward. But th that's one of those things. Most people don't know about that, but um, it's 
very interesting, and I think Washington made a great decision, even though it, you know, it it pushed the war on for for years. Who was the generals he relied on the most in New Jersey to get the job done? Well, in New Jersey, he had some some people that would rise to fame over time. And Nathaniel Green was in charge of one division. He was posted at Basking Ridge. Uh, William Maxwell did a very good job for him. Uh, Maxwell was a very uh, aggressive officer, and he stayed with Washington and the Continental Army through 1780, I believe. Um, you had uh, William Alexander, who they called Lord Sterling, because he supposedly had a, a claim to a Scottish royalty. He did a good job. He did a very good job during the Battle of Long Island by holding Washington's first line of, of combat so that uh, after the British flanked that position, Washington could fall back and form another line. And he did some very good fighting in a similar manner in New Jersey where he had to fight another rear guard action. Um, you has, also have uh, re, re-emerging uh, then who had been uh, – was uh, Daniel Morgan. I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with Morgan, but Morgan became a legend within the Continental Army and ultimately rose to the to the rank of Brigadier General. But he returned. He was from Virginia and was really a sort of a uh, country fighter. He was great with uh, light infantry, which at the time meant um, troops forward that were moving quickly, attacking and falling back. Uh, his troops, Washington made a special brigade for him of about 500 men. They all carried the uh, long rifle, which had a great range, but you had to know how to fire it. So he had really good people who knew how to fire the long rifle. They weren't wearing uniforms. They were wearing hunting shirts, and they carried a, a hatchet and a, a scalping knife and a, and, a, and, a long, and a long rifle, and they were extremely effective. And, and uh, Morgan would go on to win one of the, the best battles and uh, most decisive ones in American military history in the South, it was a small engagement known as Cowpens, but that actually turned the war around as well. So he had a number of good people working for him at the time. All right. Well, I think the million-dollar question about why history is so important is it, it, it sort of gives context to win today and sort of gives us a guide to how to win today, if you will. If we can win a revolution, we can win our daily lives. So how can people apply what you what you wrote about in the last ten books, as well as you know what they've done to keep us free, for you know set that foundation. How can we do that in our? How can we apply those kind of values and morals in our daily lives and as a country today? Well, first off, you have to understand that we live. We have the good fortune of living in a constitutional republic, that we can go vote, and if we don't like things, we can do something about it. I mean, people had to do that in the past with with guns. You know, we don't have to do it with guns now, but we have to do it. It's not going to be done for us. And that we have been bequeathed something enormously um, useful and helpful to us as individuals, but it has to be held every day by another um, generation, really. There are many people in the world who would be happy to take it away from you and um, take your wealth and take everything that you have in the future of the country. And um, you ha- we have to be willing to uh, organize and fight back, not with guns, but at the ballot box and by organizing ourselves and understanding the problem we're up against and understanding what, what we could lose. We could lose it all, you know, in, w- in one generation. But that's been known for a long time. You know, there are a lot of people, when the government was being originally formed and throughout the Civil War, understood that, you know, this union could be lost. And they, that's why a lot of people fought in the Civil War. They didn't want to u- lose the union that they knew was so prosperous and so good for them. So I would say people just need to understand th- the problem and um, organize and, and do something about it. It's not going to be done for us. We have to do something. No matter how minor it is, we have to do something. That's my best advice. I love that. Now, are you involved in any historical societies? Can people link up with you and, and discuss this deeply uh, with the email, social media? And, yeah, are there any historical societies in New Jersey that honor what you've just written in Enemy Harass? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, I was just up in Princeton last weekend. I gave a talk for the Sons of the American Revolution. Um, they had a, a, a meeting there, and I gave a talk there. 
Uh, you can look into the Sons of the American Re Revolution. They have a number of chapters throughout New Jersey, and I'm sure they're in New York and Delaware and all around this area. There's also um, Revolutionary War roundtables, and there are a number of those throughout New Jersey, and I often speak at those. Uh, those are good organizations. Uh, they're, they're very much involved in training and learning and, and re outreach to people and especially to children. So those are very good organizations. Um, I have a Facebook page uh, that people can just Google it. I mean, they can find me on um, – I have a, a website, a Facebook page, and um, that's, that's basically what I do. I, do, I give a lot of talks. Uh, through, um, I'll be in New Jersey through, probably over the next year talking a lot of those places. Uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution also um, have chapters in New Jersey. I'm going to be talking at several of their places. So uh, I'll be around, and uh, hopefully I'm going to return to, to my hometown in Westfield, and we're talking about having a pretty good-sized event there. Well, hopefully this podcast can get down there. I'd love to get to meet you and learn some history. Oh, that'd be from great, yeah. I'll, I'll be, we'll be glad to give you a notification when it comes up. That'd be awesome. Well, this has been Jim Stemple. He can be found on Amazon and all the other pages to get an enemy harassed Washington's New Jersey campaign. And uh, thanks again, Jim, for this beautiful interview today. And I love talking history. So thanks for, uh, you know, giving all of us a little bit more wisdom today. Thank you, Alex. I enjoyed it. And I will definitely be enjoying reading his book, uh, harassing an enemy uh, in the coming days. But I just want to say, if you are in the area of the Viscardi School this upcoming Saturday and want to reminisce and want to shoot the breeze and share your memories and thoughts, I'll be there 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the first ever spring wheelchair basketball sportsmanship tournament. And I know that'll be an emotional one, but we will push through it. And I know my dad will be with me even if he's not working, walking through the doors of the Viscardi Center, which I was so used to for so many years. Um, until then, we'll talk to you soon, and God bless.